Okay, this section is on curve sketching. So I know that a lot of these um, problems or these functions, you can type in the calculator and get the graph. However, this section is trying to teach you how to graph these things by hand, finding all the values, the numbers of interest, and then using that to determine what the graph will look like. So in these particular sections, you are only allowed to use the calculator to confirm your answer, especially when it comes to the test. You have to give me all of these values and you have to show me how you've gotten all of those values. I know gotten is not a word, my apologies but <laughs> how you received all of those answers, how you arrived at those conclusions um, before you actually try to put it together and draw the graph, okay? Um, so you have to be very meticulous in this particular section. Don't get carried away with the fact that you could type it in the calculator and then just pick a graph, okay? You're not allowed to do that if you want to receive the full credit for the problems on the test. So it says here, the first thing we need to do when curve sketching is determine the domain of the function. Then the second thing you want to do is determine the intercepts and any asymptotes that there might be. Then the third thing you want to do is locate the x values for which f prime of x and f double prime of x are either zero or undefined because those are your critical numbers. Use the critical numbers from step three to determine your extrema, maxes and mins, your concavity, and any points of inflection, okay? So we're gonna put all of this information together. So the first thing we wanna do is talk about the domain. The domain of a rational function is all real numbers except when your denominator equals zero. So when x minus two equals zero, or when x equals two. So my domain is going to be from negative infinity to two, and then from two to infinity everything, all real numbers, except there's no value at two, okay? So then um, then we talk about the second part, which says determine your intercepts and your asymptotes. Well, to find the y-intercept, that's probably the easier intercept to find, you just find f of zero, which means zero squared minus two times zero plus four over zero minus two, which means I get four over negative two, so negative two. So my y-intercept is equal to the point zero for x and negative two for y. The x-intercept, which is a little bit more difficult to find, um, is by setting the whole function equal to zero and then solving it. So x squared minus two x plus four over x minus two equal to zero. Well, how do we um, work out problems like that? We multiply both sides of the equation by the common denominator. And so then these two cancel on the left-hand side, leaving you with just x squared minus 2x plus 4. And 0 times anything is still going to be 0. So then if I try to factor this, um, I don't think I can factor it. The only multiples of four, one and four and two and two, and neither of those add or subtract to give me two. So the only other thing I can do is the quadratic formula to find these solutions. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus four a c all over two a. What is a, b, and c? The coefficients of x squared, x, and your constant. So a is the coefficient of x squared, which is an imaginary one. B is the coefficient of x, which is a negative two. And C is the constant, which is positive four. And what is the formula? The formula is negative B plus or minus B squared minus four AC over two A. Okay, so that's just a little quick review right there. So negative and negative is a positive two. 2 squared is 4, that would be minus 16 over 2. So I get 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 12. Since I have a negative inside the square root, that means x is imaginary or complex. But you can't graph imaginary or complex numbers, which means that there are no x-intercepts. So when you draw your graph, make sure you do not ever cross that x-axis. 
So I've got some bits of information here. I've got the domain, I've got the y-intercept, and I've got the fact that there are no x-intercepts. Now what we need to do is um, find the asymptotes. So we know that to find the um, to find the um, vertical asymptotes, vertical asymptotes occur when your denominator equals zero. And we already figured that out. That happens when x equals two. So this is your vertical asymptote at x equals two. And if you remember for horizontal asymptotes, you just take the limits to figure out the horizontal asymptotes. So we take the limit as x approaches infinity and then we also take the limit um, as x approaches negative infinity and if we get a value like 1, negative 1, 0, we get a numerical value then there is a horizontal asymptote okay and we'll know what it is after taking the limit so here if I divide both of these by x. I'm not going to write it out, I'm just going to do it. So this divided by x is x, this divided by x is 2, this divided by x is 4 over x. This term divided by x is 1, this term divided by x is 2 over x. Now let me do the same thing for this other limit as x approaches negative infinity. I will get the same values if I divide every single term by x. So then as x goes to infinity, this will go to zero, this will go to zero, and this will go to infinity. So I'll end up with infinity minus two over one, which equals infinity. So there's definitely no horizontal asymptote here. Also, um, here this will go to zero, this will go to zero, this will go to negative infinity, which means I'll get negative infinity minus 2 over 1 which is equal to negative infinity again this is not a numerical real number so I cannot um, it's just the direction in which the y values are going so I do not have any horizontal asymptote here now if you recall from um, college algebra, let me grab a paper here because I ran out of space, but if you recall from college algebra, um, you could still have something that's called a slant asymptote. And when do you have a slant asymptote? That's when the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator by one. So we could still have a slant asymptote. And the way we find those is by doing long division. So I'm going to take x minus 2 and divide it into x squared minus 2x plus 4. So what times x will give me x squared? x times x gives me x squared. But anything that comes up here has to get multiplied by the terms down here. So we distribute that x and we get x squared minus 2x. And then if you recall, whenever you're doing division, you have to subtract what you get on this line. Well, if I subtract these two terms, what ends up happening is this one becomes negative and this one ends up becoming positive. So x squared minus x squared will cancel. Negative 2x plus 2x will also cancel. And I'll need to bring down the next term. Now this degree, the degree is actually zero because there are no x's here. And the degree here is one. When this degree is smaller than that degree, I cannot multiply by anything to get four. Okay, so nothing times x will equal four without getting into fractions. So then what that means is that my slant asymptote is at y equals the quotient. And in my case, the quotient well, the quotient's always up here, okay? But my quotient is x. So I have a dotted line x that I won't, that my ends will not cross, okay? So that's finding the, um, the asymptotes. 
Now the next thing I need to do is find my critical numbers. So I'm going to find the first derivative. To do that, I will have to do I will have to do the first derivative. So low d high minus high d low over low squared. So I get um, 2x squared minus 2x minus 4x plus 4 minus x squared plus 2x minus 4 all over x minus 2 squared. So these two terms cancel, these two terms cancel, and I can reduce this and get x squared minus 4x over x minus 2 squared. Okay, now I need to figure out when f prime equals zeros. That's when the numerator equals zero. So if I factor this and set each factor equal to zero, I get two critical numbers here. Now for my denominator equal to zero, I can square both sides and get x minus two still equal to zero, add two on both sides and I get x equal to two. So I can use this information to break up my number line so here's 2, which is not included, remember, from the domain, and here's 4. Then I'm going to pick some test numbers, like 0, 3, and 5, and plug them into this derivative here. So let's see, I'm going to program my calculator real quick. Um, x squared minus 4x divided by x minus 2 squared. I'm going to ignore the first value, but now I'm going to start plugging in my values here. So f prime of 0 equals what sign? Zero, 0. Oh, that's why, because that's also a critical number. I was like, wait a minute, something is not right here. Yes. So we have another number zero. We had two critical numbers here and then one there. So we cannot pick zero. We have to pick one and then maybe negative one. So let's plug in negative one. Um, we get a positive. Is a positive. Let's try f prime of positive one. negative. Let's try f prime of 3. We get a negative. Let's try f prime of 5. Oops, what did I do there? Store x. We get a positive. Okay, since it changes from positive increasing to decreasing, that means there's a max at x equal to zero. You can find the y value by plugging zero into the original equation, which we have done already. We have plugged zero into the original equation and we found out that the y value is negative two. So that happens to be a relative max. Now here, it's just decreasing and then decreasing some more. So no change here going around 2. So there's no max or min or anything like that happening around 2. Um, actually, and there wouldn't be because 2 is not even a point on the graph. Now around 4, it's decreasing and then increasing, which means there's a relative min at x equal to 4. And if we want to know the y value, we would have to plug the y value into here. So 4 squared is 16 minus 8 plus 4, the numerator is 12, and then 4 minus 2 is 2, so 12 divided by 2 is 6. So the y value here is 6. Now we need to continue with the information from the second derivative. So for the second derivative, we will have to do the um, quotient rule again. So I'm this derivative and applying the quotient rule again. So I've got low 
d high minus high d low all over low squared. So this is one term, this is a second term. Now, notice that in both of these, you can factor out an x minus two. And when I do that, I would still have one x minus two left here in the first term, but I would not have an x minus two here. And then the denominator, a square and a square, will make x minus two to the fourth. So I can reduce this factor with one of these, leaving me with three. For the numerator, I'm gonna foil all this out. So I get two x squared minus four x minus four x plus eight. And here I'm gonna distribute a negative two. So negative two times x squared is negative two x squared. A negative two times negative four is a positive eight x. And then you'll notice that the two x squared, negative two x squared, the two negative four x's and the positive four x, 8x will land me with just 8 over x minus 2 cubed. Now this can never equal 0 because 8 can never equal 0, the numerator. However, my denominator can equal 0. And if I cube root both sides, I get this equation. And if I add 2 to both sides, I get this equation. So really, our number line, the second derivative, um, only consists of the number 2 which we know is not in the domain, okay? So to test for concavity, we have to pick a number less than two and a number greater than two. So f double prime of zero equals, remember double prime is this. So if I plug zero into here, I'm gonna get negative two cubed, which is eight, and eight over eight is one, which is a positive value. Um, if I plug in, oh, nope, I apologize. If I plug in zero in here, I get negative two cubed, which is negative eight. And eight divided by a negative eight is actually a negative one. Now, if I plug in four, I get four minus two, which is a positive two, and positive two cubed is a positive eight. Eight divided by that eight will give me a positive one. So on this half, you have concave down and on the other half, you have concave up, okay? And since there is a change here, you would have an inflection point at two, but since two is not gonna have a point on the graph due to the domain over here, you don't have an inflection point at all. Okay, so let's try to put this information together to try to draw the graph. So we know that we have a y-intercept of zero and negative two. We know that we have a vertical asymptote at x equal to two. Okay, what else do we know? We know that there's no x-intercepts. We know we don't have a horizontal asymptote. We know that there is a slant asymptote at y equals x. Okay, which is this line here. And we know that, let's see here, we have a relative max at zero and negative two. So if this is the highest point, then the graph has no choice but to trail off there and to trail off here because I cannot cross these lines. They're asymptotes. And then I have a relative min at four and six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, since this is a minimum, that means this has to go upward towards that asymptote and this has to go upward towards this asymptote. But again, never crossing those asymptotes. So putting all the information, let's see the concavity. Does this match our concavity? 
So on the left of 2, on this side, it should be concave down. This is in fact concave down. And to the right of 2, it should be concave up. This is in fact concave up. And there is no inflection point in our graph. No place where it wiggles and it changes concavity. Okay. Now that we've done all of the work, we can confirm, just so that if you're on the test, you can kind of correct your mistakes if you mess up. Um, find out what the graph actually looks like. So I'm going to go back here and type in x squared minus 2x plus 4 divided by x minus 2 and graph it. And if you notice, our graph looks like our function here that we've graphed. Okay, So everything checks out and we've done this properly. I apologize that this video is a little long, but these problems do take a while to work out. So most likely on the test, you'll only be given one problem um, and not multiple on the test.